وينشر الهدي إيمانا وموعظة فبالجهالة قد خابت مساعينا خابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا وغسلينا خابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا وأوشك اليأس أن يغشى أمانينا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to another edition of the Sulaiman Rabbit Show. In the midst of this heat wave, is it hot or is it hot? I tell you. Yeah, you know, it, it reminds me of one thing. You can you can hear from my voice. I'm a bit croaky, and that's uh, as a result of continuous exposure to the aircon. Because at night you're in this dilemma. It's so hot that if you do not keep the aircon on while you're sleeping, uh, you can't get sleep. You're tossing and turning and, and, and sweating and it's too hot. And if you're on it and, and you keep it on for the duration of, of, of your sleep, then it kind of uh, has an effect on your throat and on your nose. And for those, those of us uh, who are in public speaking, we try and minimize our exposure to the uh, aircon because it has an impact on your vocal cords. It has an impact on you know uh, everything that makes you sound not so good uh, as a result of uh, overexposure. But in, in the midst of a heat wave like this, there's, there's very little option that you have because either you leave it on or you're not going to sleep. And, in, and if you don't sleep, then um, mentally you're fatigued, uh, besides the physical fatigue, and then uh, you're unable to think and, 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 and streamline your thoughts, and that makes public speaking uh, very difficult. So uh, it reminded me of something, you know, that uh, in, in, in winter we have a similar problem because... Uh, if it gets very cold and you have to on the, the, the AC but on the heat function, but then again, it makes your vocal cords very dry and, and it, it leads to a similar kind of problem. But in, in winter, you, you kind of like try to overcome it with a humidifier and that. But, but the bottom line, I was saying to my wife uh, the other night, I said, this just reminds us that uh, this dunya, this, this transitory world, this uh, temporary world that we, that we reside in and, and we, in which we live, it's not perfect. It can never, never be perfect and we should not expect it to be perfect. Because no matter who you are and uh, how much of money you may have, you may have the, you know, the most sophisticated system and that kind of thing. But in the end, there's nothing that's going to sort it out to the extent where it's perfect. And all of these things, I'm just using a very simple mundane example of, of, of heat and the air con and that kind of thing. It just reminds us that uh, when these things happen in our lives, we need to then realign our focus and we need to use these opportunities to remind ourselves that look at the end of the day at the end of the day uh, we need to strive for that one place that's perfect that one place where allah has created perfection that one place where we will get whatever we want and that place is jannah jannah paradise and and, and we know we know allah has sent his nabi allah has sent his prophet allah has sent his books Allah has sent the scholars who are the inheritors and the successors of the prophets and they constantly communicate to us and they remind us and you know they emphasize to us what is the pathway to Jannah, how to get there, what to do, what not to do, you know. And the problem is that uh, we, 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 don't, um, we, we don't take it as seriously as we should. We, we're so busy trying to secure uh, perfection in this world. We are so busy uh, trying to come as close as we possibly can uh, to perfection in this world that uh, we don't realize that in this world we must be satisfied with, with, with a basic level. I mean, uh, our deen, our, our religion does not teach us uh, to shun this world altogether. Uh, you have to go out and make money. You have to sustain yourself. Uh, you should live well. You should endeavor to live well. You should en endeavor to ensure that your, your children live well. All of those things. But uh, within certain parameters, within certain realistic parameters, it cannot be that you want more and more and better and better because then you kind of lose the plot in life. You, you, you kind of strive for perfection in an imperfect place, in a place where you will never realize perfection, in a place where you are never going to achieve perfection because it's an imperfect place. And, and, and what happens then is that uh, you lose focus on, 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 your, on, your, on your broader goal on the more important journey, and that is the journey towards the year uh, the, to the after, the akhirah. And, and that is where you're going to secure perfection, but you need to do the right things now, in this world. In this imperfect way, you need to do the right things and, and lead the right, right kind of lifestyle, and that will lead you to, um, to securing perfection. And, and, and the beauty of the perfection of Jannah is this, that uh, once you secure it, you have it. There is absolutely no fear of you losing it. In this world, 
no matter what you secure it may be a lifelong dream uh, it may be something that very few people have been able to secure it may be the only thing you know it may be a unique achievement you're the only person in the world who managed to achieve that whatever it may be whatever it may be but as soon as you get it there's always the fear that you lose it uh, if you get to number one on the Forbes list you're the richest person in the world you're already starting to think that when will the next list come out and will I still be there at number one uh, when you purchase that car there's always the the risk it'll get stolen it I'll meet up in an accident it can get damaged uh, you know you get your dream spouse there's always the fear that you know at some point things may not work out one of you may pass away there's this fear that's the nature of this world that whatever you have no matter you know how good it may be there's always that fear that it's not going to last and in many instances it doesn't last uh, I read something on whatsapp this week where somebody said that uh, one of the one of the khulafa during uh, Islamic history they asked one of the philosophers or one of the poets who used to attend the royal court that look uh, I want to wear a ring I want to wear a ring but I want you to engrave on this ring I want you to engrave on this ring something that when I'm sad if I le- if I read it it'll make me happy and uh, when I'm happy if I read it it'll make sure that you know I don't let my happiness go out of bounds and whoever this was the poet or the philosopher within the royal court what he did was that um, he, he engraved on that ring this moment too shall pass this moment will also pass in other words when you sad and, and and you read that engraved on the ring that this moment will also pass it gives you hope that you know what sadness is not forever inna ma'al usri yusra inna ma'al usri yusra there is this fluctuation of of, of emotions and, and 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 positivity and negativity optimism and pessimism in a person's life so uh, i've read when you're feeling sad and you look down at your ring and, and you see that phrase that this too shall pass you understand that okay you know what happy times is around the corner but but when when you're enjoying some sort of happiness and you look at that ring and you also understand hey look happiness is not forever yes obviously save at the moment and, and enjoy it because that's how life is the next day you will have another challenge to tackle but uh, in the end in the end of it all we you, you need to be focused and you need to say look this is an imperfect world happiness doesn't last forever sadness doesn't last forever success doesn't last forever you know I, I did some research on happiness a few months ago for a talk that I needed to deliver and uh, they say that statistically even if you reach the or, or other research has shown even if you reach the, the biggest uh, the biggest you know milestones in your life uh, you achieve the the big objectives of your life you purchase the house that you've been working for for so many years that happiness doesn't last more than six months after six months the novelty wears off after six months it just becomes another possession of yours and you start yearning now for something else so we need to become we need to be careful you know when when these things happen in our life we need to use them as opportunities uh, to remind ourselves that, hey listen this is a very imperfect world this is a world where things uh, are never going to be the way i want them to be uh, you you achieve one thing you think that this is what you need to do but then that that comes with its own set of unintended consequences so you are privileged enough allah has blessed you with enough wealth that you you have a you have a house you have shelter you are able to afford an, an, an air conditioner you are able to afford the electricity bill that is required uh, to power that ac you got all of that you've managed to achieve all of that in your life which many people don't have but then when you want it it, it knocks your, your 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 nasal system and it knocks your vocal cords uh, totally out so that's the nature of 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 dunya it's always imperfect it always reminds us you know this world also gives us uh, it's constant uh, and uh, and sometimes subtle and sometimes very uh, open uh, and, and and emphatic reminders with regards to its imperfections uh, indicating to us that focus on the perfect uh, paradise that is to come and live your life in such a way that uh, you will secure that perfection and once you secure that perfection once you secure jannah the first benefit is there's never a fear of losing it uh, that perfection will last for eternity so when the hadith tells us that in jannah you get ما لا عين رأت ولا أذن سمعت ولا خطر على قلب بشر that uh, you get in Jannah that which no eye has seen and uh, no ear has heard and that which no heart has been able to imagine it, it's not something that will last just for those initial moments in, 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 in Jannah it will last forever because the creator of Jannah is forever and the treasures of the creator of Jannah is, uh, is limitless and therefore what happens then is that uh, there, there is no fear there's absolutely 
no, no fear of losing out. So those are just a few opening thoughts for this week. <laughs> Now, earlier this week, I, I had an opportunity of uh, attending a conference at Gallagher State. And it was a two-day conference which was hosted by the Black Management Forum. And uh, when, when I got there, I wasn't there the first day. I understand that President Jacob Zuma delivered a keynote address on the first day. And that's how I had many high-profile people. And here you had, uh, you know, black people who are very successful. CEOs of companies, chairmen of companies, uh, very successful entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. And, and, and they gathered for the two-day seminar, which was to be followed by the AGM and the elections of the Black Management Forum. And I ended up there because there was a Muslim, uh, there was an invite given to the Muslim community. Uh, one of the panel discussions towards the tail end of the conference was to discuss um, empowerment. Now, their, their theme, their overall theme for the entire conference was realizing transformation dividends through courageous leadership. Uh, realizing, realizing transformation dividends uh, through courageous leadership and uh, the theme of the panel that I was to speak to, uh, speak in uh, together with Kali Kriel from Afri Forum and together with uh, Paul Bacher from the Jewish community uh, the, the, the title of that particular um, panel was Empowered Lessons from the Different Communities and uh, the reason I'm talking to you this evening about it uh, is because you know I learned a lot in terms of my own experience there uh, naturally I mean these are high flyers right so they dress to the nines they supremely articulate, they supremely articulate, they exude confidence. I mean, you know, they, they just radiating confidence like you cannot believe because that's the nature of the work that they do. And um, in, in, in the panel prior to mine, uh, there were a number of, of female executives speaking and, and there was a strong anti-religious undertone, anti-religious undertone from the side of, you know, the religious sector has, has kept females back and uh, you don't find a female priest and you why why doesn't hasn't the world seen a female pope uh, and that kind of thing and yeah i'm sitting and, and our panel was last and my speech was dead last uh in the panel and i'm thinking to myself you know uh, what am i going to tell these people because what i had in mind about uh, speaking uh, it, it was a message that was relevant to to their discussion to their themes but at the same time it came from a very strong uh, faith-based uh, perspective and i'm thinking to myself you know, will my message even resonate with these people? Because, uh, you know, th these are, they, you know, with no disrespect intended, they came across as, uh, as people who are very focused on their careers, very focused on their goals, very, uh, very hedonistic in many ways. Not, not, not people who are really driven by faith as such, and not people who are really driven by, uh, by the kind of things that perhaps you and I are driven by. And, um, and then on top of it, uh, that, that was one thing. And the other thing is that at times the discussion was, was pretty much uh, focused on, on different models and different prototypes which were very relevant to the industries and um, you know, the fields that they were involved in. And, and, and I, I had obviously come prepared to the, uh, to the seminar. It, it, it was a panel discussion. You've got to do a 10-minute presentation uh, first up. And after that, uh, you know, then you take questions from the floor and there's interaction between the panelists and, and, and you know, with, from the panel to the floor. And I, I had some thoughts that uh, I, I had uh, prepared and I, I had some notes and I was ready to go. But as this you know, seminar was unfolding, because even though my, my talk was last uh, in the afternoon, I, I was there from the morning. I wanted to get a good sense of what it was all about. And obviously, when you go to these kind of events, you also want to be uh, exposed to the views of other people. And, and whilst we may not be in the corporate sector and whilst we may not be in that particular field, you also want to get a feel of, of, of what, what's happening there and what are their views and how they see the countries and what do we have in common and that kind of thing. So as this thing was progressing, I was learning a lot. I was really impressed uh, by, by the auditory skill of some of those speakers, uh, by, by their, you know, their eloquence, by the depth of their reading and their knowledge, uh, by their you know, deep philo philo philosophical insight, that kind of thing. But it's also so getting, I was getting worried as the, the time was coming closer for me to speak as to whether my message, which is a very strong faith-based message, would actually resonate with them or not. And I thank uh, Almighty Allah, I thank Allah that what happened was that when eventually I did speak, uh, Alhamdulillah, the speech was very, very, very well received. It, it resonated, I mean, uh, people were, 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 at that particular time, they, they were, you know, starting to feel a bit tired. It was, it was late in the afternoon, I started speaking at about uh, 20 to 4, uh, and, uh, you know, people started, you know, very vociferously taking notes. Uh, there were a number of ovations 
uh, you know, in between while I was speaking and there was a lot of appreciation after I had spoken. Even the co-panelists were, were quite appreciative. Now, why am I mentioning all of this? It's because it, then it hit me and it hit me hard that, you know, sometimes we, we also perhaps tend to underestimate the power uh, in, in the words of Allah and the power in the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and how people, no matter how on the outward, they may seem to be very far away from the kind of values and the kind of principles that Muslims or even people of faith in general subscribe to or uh, adhere to or align themselves to. But people out there are thirsty for a spiritual message. People are out there are thirsty for an inspirational message. And that's what I learned. Because as I said, when I was listening to these different speeches and the kind of angles and the kind of undertone, I started getting worried that, you know, giving a kind of faith-driven, inspirational, motivational, uh, thought-provoking kind of speech here uh, is not going to gel amongst uh, these people. And it gelled. And the reason why I, I concluded at the end that it gelled is that because people are thirsty for spirituality. Religion, religion gives you that purpose at the end of the day. Religion puts things into perspective for you. Religious makes you understand uh, the why. Everything else wants to focus on the how. Religion makes you focus on the why. And it just gives you such great perspective. So uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to share some of the content of what I discussed uh, uh, at that seminar. Uh, firstly, just to show that you know, our dean has the answers for everyone in every field. But more importantly, these discussions are very relevant to our own communities. Uh, the key words that stood out from the two titles, the, the title of the entire two-day conference, Realizing Transformation, Dividends Through Courageous Leadership, uh, the key words there was transformation and leadership. And with regards to the panel in specific, the key word there was empowerment. So transformation, leadership and empowerment. Our dean has a lot to say about that. And it's so important for us as Muslims to understand that as well, even if you're not in the corporate world, but for the progress of our own community, the, uh, the, uh, our own ummah, for the progress of humanity, we need to understand these things. Transformation, leadership and empowerment. And therefore I thought it would be very apt. Then from, from my notes of that particular um, uh, you know, conference, and obviously it wasn't only my, my input. I had, I had colleagues and friends who had made suggestions and who had advised me in terms of what input to make and what angles to take and what to bring up, etc. I thought I'd share some of that with, uh, with the audience this evening on the program so that it can resonate with us as well because each one of us are leaders in our own way and, and many of the viewers out there would be in some leadership position or the other. So inshallah, when, uh, when we come back uh, from the break, uh, that, that is what we will do. Remember that uh, the email address, the Twitter handle, the Facebook details, all of that, the email address, all of that will flash on your screen on a repeated basis throughout the program. Please do interact with us, give us feedback, let us know what you are thinking, what are your thoughts. And when we come back from the break, we get stuck into that discussion about transformation, leadership and empowerment. <laughs> Welcome back. So, as I said, we're going to speak about transformation, leadership, and empowerment. Three things. Transformation, leadership, and empowerment. The first point I made, I said, that from a religious perspective, every prophet that came to planet Earth came with an agenda of transformation and an agenda of empowerment. Now, this is very profound because... Politicians think that they are the only ones driving the agenda of transformation and empowerment. Uh, businessmen in the corporate sector, they would think that they are the only ones driving the, uh, the agenda of transformation and empowerment. But even, even those who are in the religious sector, even faith-based organizations, faith-based communities, they are driving a transformation, uh, an agenda of transformation and empowerment, or they ought to be, even without realizing it. And that's what every prophet came to do. How? Well... Why did Allah wa ta send the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam, uh, to planet earth? It was for them to transform societies that were unfair, unjust, unequal, and that had only vice, to transform those societies into just societies, equitable societies, fair societies, societies of, of virtue and fidelity. So that's a transformation agenda. And in order to be able to secure that transformation, they needed to empower people. And after they had secured the transformation, uh, to sustain uh, the transformation which was now secured, they needed to empower people to continue the legacy. So 
we also need to understand that uh, when it comes to the survival of the ummah when it comes to the survival of organizations communities countries transformation is key and the kind of challenges that we face when we have to drive a transformation agenda uh, is not something new the anbiya also faced those challenges if you look at nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his time there were agents who resisted the call for change why they resisted the calls for transformation uh, of the society they resisted it because they were the beneficiaries of the status quo so i made this point in this particular conference because here they were talking about what they call positive discrimination which is another word for uh, another phrase for affirmative action and they saying look um, they they are people who resist this why do they resist it because they don't want things to change because they are the beneficiaries of the status quo they are the beneficiaries of things as they are so they uh, they are the agents of resistance if you want to call them that but this problem is not new because when you calling for a transformation especially a transformation that's got to do with the equitable distribution of wealth um, the spirit of hard working and an excellence uh, mutual respect and, and you know diverse communities living together there are going to be people who are who will resist that because it goes contrary to to what their own interests are at that particular time in order to prevail in order to prevail leaders who are driving the transformation and empowerment agenda they need to have moral authority they need to have moral authority and how will they have moral authority they will only have moral authority if they do not exempt themselves from persecution at the hands of those who feel threatened by the prospect of the change in other words they do not separate themselves from the hardship of the masses nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself said if they place the sun in my right hand and they place the moon in my left hand to try and get me to give up the call of islam the call for transformation i will never stop i will never stop until either allah grants me success or i die trying until either allah grants me success or i die trying and 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 this is where you know leaders true leaders stand out they have the courage of their convictions they know what it means to drive the agenda of transformation even if you look uh, you know closer to home nelson mandela he was prepared to die for the courage uh, for for his convictions he was prepared to die for it and when the masses see that when the masses see that you are able to put your own life uh, your own career on the line to drive transformation and to drive empowerment that's when you get moral authority so firstly you 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 must share in the hardship of those people that you are leading there cannot be a disconnect between the leadership and the masses and the second thing is you need to prevail over your people by your good conduct you need to lead by example you need to show courage there there is a there is a quote that i read somewhere that people don't follow titles they don't follow you because you have titles they follow courage they're looking for courageous leaders the next thing we need to understand in as far as uh, transformation is concerned is that transformation does not imply a new beginning it doesn't mean you have to start all over again it doesn't mean that everything is wrong it means you do a a very thorough and a very objective and a very um introspective kind of analysis of the status quo and that which is positive you keep it but you refine it and you better it and that which is negative you transform it and and that's exactly what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did and i gave this example i said if you see the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to arabia or he was well he was sent as a nabi to 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 the arabian people and what was their their state we all know they had degenerated to such an extent that the superpowers of the time did not want to rule over the arabs that was the kind of pitiable situation that the arabs found themselves in right however having said that they were plagued by paganism they were plagued by tribalism they were plagued, plagued by petty squabbles or petty squabbles but notwithstanding all of that they had some remarkable qualities they were known for their hospitality they were known for their courage they were known for their generosity so it was not all bad and when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam came he saw the positive he worked on that he refined it and he transformed the negative to an extent that that nation whom the superpowers of the time did not want to rule over they became an exemplary nation that took the call of islam throughout the world 
and other people started to follow their example other people started to subscribe to their values which was in reality the example and the values of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, the nabi of allah came and he transformed the society when he saw that they were obsessed with tribalism he said to them that look kullukum min adam all of you are from adam and eve and adam and eve were created from soil what gives you the right to feel superior to a fellow human based on your race on your ancestry on your tribe on on your wealth status on your political status in akramakum indallahi atqakum the criteria in the eyes of god in the eyes of allah is whose conduct is the best and whose actions are the best so that's the criteria for superiority not your race not your sex not your wealth not your tribe not your ancestry not your bravery nothing no no none of that so transformation doesn't mean you start afresh it doesn't mean you start new and also transformation requires leaders with the skill set that can appeal directly and arouse the masses to confront the major challenges of their circumstances if we look at the anbiya alayhi wassalatu wassalam they were empowered to challenge their audiences in what they thought uh, the experts of the day excelled isa alayhi salatu wassalam in his era medicine was at its peak and uh, the physicians dominated the narrative uh, the doctors dominated the narrative at the time and when isa alayhi salam by the will of god when jesus was able to raise the dead from the grave he prevailed uh, over that narrative because he was able to take on the dominant sector of the time the same with musa alayhi salatu wassalam in his era it was the time it was it was the era of magicians it was the era of sorcerers it was the era of of magic and when he defeated them in front of pharaoh uh, he defeated the dominant sector of the time and and that's uh, and that's how you know these different examples can go on and on and and we as muslims need to learn from that uh, i i normally say this to matriculants when i'm invited uh, you know to address matriculants at matric dinners and that kind of thing i say to them we need to be diverse in our skill set uh, in in the indian community it's known that because my father was an accountant i'll be an accountant i because i'm an accountant my son will be an accountant and then we gravitate towards certain uh, you know uh, fields accounting teaching medicine chemistry and you know a few others uh, and now it's good to say that alhamdulillah there are many youngsters they are diver- they, they are diversifying and they're going into different fields because whatever are the dominant fields of that time in order for you to have an impact as an ummah in order for you to lead uh, the agenda of transformation and the agenda of of uh, of uh, empowerment <clears throat> in order for you to play a part in changing the narrative and making it a better narrative uh you need to be able to prevail over the dominant sectors of uh, of the time so those were a few key things with regards uh, you know transformation but then a key part of transformation is obviously empowerment then i move on you know from the broader discussion on transformation which was part of the overall theme for the two day conference and i spoke more about empowerment which was the specific theme for the panel that that i was in and i mentioned that a, a, a crucial aspect of transformation is empowerment empowerment in an organization is very important and more so now than ever before because the sustainability of an organization depends on empowerment if you don't empower other people their morale will be low uh they will f- they, they they won't want to take increased responsibility they won't feel the need to be able to do more for the organization do more for the company do more for the cause but then we came to the heart of it isn't it because in order for a leader to be willing to empower other people that leader himself or herself needs to be empowered so you need to start with self empowerment you need to understand that empowerment empowers those that implement it if a leader doesn't understand that it would mean that the leader is insecure the leader would be scared to empower others because he feels uh, that one day i'll become dispensable and that person will know everything that i know um when when a leader is focused only on his own career his own role i am the chairman of this organization uh, and he feels insecure now he puts his own interest over the interest of the organization his own interest over the interest of the cause he'll obviously just his nafs will justify it to him his nafs will make him think that i'm the best person for the role and therefore i need to you know to hold on to it very tightly and that kind of thing uh, so it'll create the self justifications come across very easily but at the root of it it would simply be this that his own interests are being put in front of the interests of the organization and the cause because he's not secure and therefore he becomes very reluctant 
to, uh, to empower other people. And this is where I explain to them that Islam talks about servant leadership, not career oriented leadership or ego oriented leadership. In the business world, that CEO does not want to empower the people. And they spoke about this at the very conference. They said, look, we, we drive the, 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 the transformation agenda. We talk about positive discrimination. And then you get black CEOs who, when they make it to the top, they become gatekeepers and they stifle the progress of other black people. And the day they leave, then there isn't another black CEO to take this, the, the position because they did not equip somebody to be able to be ready to deal with it. And that happens when you are career centric. That happens when you are more committed to your own interest and to the cause. You put your own interests first. You are reluctant to empower other people because you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to. You want to be to be indispensable for as long as possible, and at the same time, you, you don't want anybody to challenge you. You don't want anybody to be as good as you or even better than you. But Islam drives a very different concept, and we need to understand this. Even when it's not about a career, it may be you know when you're involved in in a, in a community organization. So it's not a career as such. There's no financial reward, but that's where it's ego driven. You know where you start to believe that you're the only person capable of doing it, and as a result, you 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 you, you find it hard to empower other people. Islam talks about servant leadership. Remember the the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Sayyidul Qaumi Khadimuhum, the leader of a nation. Is, uh, is the servant of a nation. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has taught us that um, believers are like rain, like light rain. Wherever you go, you must be spreading goodness. So your motto in life must not, to be, must not necessarily be to lead. It must be to serve. And, and leaders are the ones uh, who, who serve the most. You, you need to empower yourself first. You need to rise above your own insecurities. And when you do that and you are able to empower yourself first, uh, and and you, you see yourself as a servant and you say, okay, I will empower people because uh, that will be a thawab ajariya for me. One day when I can no longer do it, uh, one day when I'm no longer here and my eyes are closed, I would have left people who can do it as good as I did or even better and that will be a thawab ajariya for me. So you, you, need to, you need to understand that your mission is to contribute to the cause, not to contribute to your own progress or your own profile. And that's what Islam advocates. And that's what miss, what's missing. That's why I heard somebody once said that when a person who play, was a leader, when he passes on or when he leaves and people pay tribute to him and they say, well, you know, it'll be very difficult to fill his shoes. In reality, that's not a compliment. That's, that's a big criticism. That's an insult. Because it means he was not enough of a leader to be able to have trained people whilst he was there and occupied that position, to have been able to train people who could take over from him. And great leaders are those people who are able to develop great leaders. Average leaders are the ones who lead well. Great leaders are the ones who lead well, but then are able to train leaders who can do it just as well and even better. And when somebody comes and does it better, they are happy. They are happy because the cause is benefiting. They always put the cause before themselves. It's not about the individual, it's about the cause. And I gave them a great example and I said, look at the Prophet Moses, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, peace be upon him. This was a dark-skinned man. He was an African. He's the most mentioned prophet in the Quran. And when Allah gave him a position, such a position, it's the highest position that a human can ever get. The position of Nubuwa. Allah grants him Nubuwa. Allah grants him prophethood. Allah talks to him directly. And what does he do at that particular time? If there's ever a position where you would want to be selfish, where you would want exclusivity, it is the position of Nubuwa. Because that's the highest position. You are now Allah's messenger on earth. Yet, Musa alayhi salam understood. And that's why he was so beloved and dear to Allah. He understood, it's not about me. It's not about Musa. It's about the cause. So he made dua immediately. وَأَخِي هَارُونُ هُوَ أَفْصَحُ مِنِّي لِسَانًا فَأَرْسِلْهُ مَعِيَ رِدْءًا يُصَدِّقُنِي That, oh Allah, I have a speech impediment. I can't talk clearly. I, I'm not eloquent. And in order for me to be able to do my work, I need somebody who's eloquent in speech. My brother Harun, he's eloquent. Allah grant him nubuwa as well. Let me share this privilege and honor with him so that we are able to do more justice to the cause. Subhanallah. The scholars have written, if there was ever a brother who made a great dua for his brother, it was Musa alayhi salam who made dua for his brother to be granted nubuwa. But you see, he was focused on the greater goals. He was focused on the mission. And that is when he was able to, he was able to, to rise above, you know, having a selfish kind of uh, mindset and wanting something only for yourself and share 
so that the, the, the cause could benefit. Empowerment gives ownership and with ownership comes a sense of responsibility. When you empower other people, what happens is their, their confidence starts building. They become more assertive. They don't shy away from decision making. You then don't have to micromanage. You've got people who are willing to, to lessen your burden. Nowadays in many organizations, what happens? As people grow older, they become more possessive. They become very suspicious of the younger generation. They lecture ad nauseum. What do you people know? I've been doing it for so many years. I was in this organization when you were not even born, that kind of thing. And, and they, 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 they say, no, no, I'm willing to hand over to young people. But then they look for young people who are perfect. And they forget that they were far from perfect when they started. They had to make mistakes. You see, when you, when you teach a child how to dry, ride a bicycle, you know full well that uh, my child will have to fall, will have to get scrapes and cuts and bruises on the knee, will have to, you know, uh, come a few times crying, crying to mommy, a few uh, drops of blood would, would have to flow. Then my child will have a true appreciation of what it is to balance on a bicycle. If the child just, just goes and starts riding and doesn't go through that process of falling a few times and, and you know, feeling a bit of pain and, 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 and having to deal with a few scrapes and scratches and, and bruises, then you as a parent, having gone through it yourself, would know, hey, this is not the right procedure and process. Similarly, when you're handing over to the young generation, you must know that there will be mistakes. There will be a bit of over-enthusiasm. There will be a bit of, of, of arrogance from the younger generation. But you cannot forget that you were yourself like that when you started off. And time refined you. And the work matured you. So you must be willing to hand over. To these days, people become too possessive. They just you know they start making themselves believe that only they can do it you know, and no one else can do it. We see it in families also. The father will his whole life say, no, I'm, I'm building out this business. One day it will benefit my son and my grandson. And then when he hands over to the son and grandson, he kind of suffers from a complex and then he always wants to go into the business. This is wrong. That is wrong. Why do you people know? I started this business and, and, and it creates unnecessary tension. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was way above that. Look at uh, the battle of Khandak. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was willing to listen to new ideas. When Salman Farsi radiallahu anh, mentioned about the trench, it was something that the Arabs had never heard of. But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do what many elders in our communities do and say, hey, don't come with your fancy ideas here. Yeah? No, he said, hey, that might actually work. And after that, after that, he led by example. He was there, uh, you know, chopping those rocks. And, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was totally covered in, in, in mud. It's only empowerment that relieves leaders of the burden of having to micromanage their colleagues. Uh, otherwise, if you're not empowering other people, they, 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 they develop a safe player mindset. They just expect you to tell them all the time what to do. And when you're not there to tell them or when you cannot deal with telling everybody all the time, every time, then the organization does not progress. And some people stifle progress. They keep things small. They keep things standard just so that they don't lose hold of, of the, they don't lose their grip. Uh, they don't realize that the cause is more important than the individual. In, in the end of the day, empowerment is what leads to, um, to sustainable growth. Uh, empowerment is what transforms groups of individuals into teams. So, you know, these are a few things and, and they are deep things and we need to understand these things if we are going to appreciate what leadership is all about. So, true leaders are those who are more committed to the cause. Yes, you will benefit as an individual, but it's always about the cause. You must be strong enough and courageous enough to be able to walk away when the time is right. Uh, look at Madiba. Look at Madiba here in this country. If there was anybody who was entitled to say, you know what, I want to be president for the rest of my life, it was him. Because he, he, 27 years of sacrifice, 27 years of being in prison, 27 years that cost him his marriage, that cost him uh, the, the opportunity of seeing his children grow up, of, of being there for the birth of his grandchildren, he, he could have come out and said, hey, I've paid my dues. Now I want to be president till the day I die. But he said, one term, one term. And after that, what did he do? Even though Thabo Mbeki, political analyst will tell us, was not his preferred choice for successor. But once the party said, Mbeki will be your deputy, he gave him all the room, he gave him all the space to develop, uh, to take over the reins. And after one term, uh, he moved on. I'm not saying that it must only be one term. No, I'm just saying there must be that mindset that I, I will serve, but part of my mandate when I'm serving is to be able to empower others. In, to be able to start that succession planning almost immediately so that there is that freshness and uh, there is that balance between, uh, between young and old. Uh, we need leaders. You see, today it's unfortunate that leaders are defined by their ability to outsmart their opponents. 
by their ability to unseat others and secure their own seat. And, and when leadership is more than that, I, I just explained previously, leadership is about being willing to serve the cause, wherever the calling may be, in whichever position. These days, there are too many career oriented leaders. And that's why we don't progress. That's why we got all the policies and all the rules and regulations about transformation and empowerment. Uh, but it doesn't get done because people are career orientated. Uh, people are not willing to do more for the cause than they, they are need to do, they do for themselves. You, you need to have leaders of integrity. We know that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the word go, he was known as as sadiq he was known as Al-Ameen. He was known as a person of integrity. Now that, that, those are the ingredients of, of leadership. And we need to start as a Muslim community having these discussions about what are the criteria for leadership. Uh, what, what, are the, what, what does Islam tell us about transformation? What does Islam tell us about empowerment? What does Islam tell us about leadership? So that we can improve. It's not about criticizing anyone. It's not about using it as a stick to beat anyone. It's about understanding how we need to use the very principles of our deen. And, and the very concepts that are so entrenched in the seerah and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be able to rise and adequately meet the challenges of the time. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Welcome back. Well, that uh, discussion was based on a few points that as I said, I, I discussed early on at a conference uh, this week which I attended. Uh, the Black Management uh, Forum Conference, and I had to speak a little bit about the overall theme which dealt with transformation and the specific theme on the panel where I was talking and that it, uh, to deal with empowerment. And, I've, and, and because it resonated so well with the audience and they felt that um, these faith-based messages gave, give them so much of, of perspective, I realize that sometimes we undervalue the impact, the spiritual impact that uh, the, the examples of the Quran and Sunnah have. And th th that's one point, and that's why I shared it. But the second point is that these concepts are something that we sell to the world, but we forget to remind ourselves of. And, and there's so much of this that we need to internalize and we need to use as points of reflection and introspection to be able to better ourselves as leaders, to be able to better leadership within the community, to be able to drive those agendas of transformation and empowerment, which every Nabi uh, came with, as I explained earlier on. And I hope that uh, these points were beneficial. As I said, we, we look forward to your interaction, your feedback, your thoughts on, on what we discussed during the program, whether it's via email or via Twitter or via Facebook or whatever else. And uh, we request your du'as, inshallah, and if Allah wa ta'ala is willed, and if we are still alive, uh, then we will meet again, same place, same time, next week. Uh, enjoy the heat wave. I understand that as we go uh, deeper into the weekend, uh, we're going we're gonna to be hitting the 40s, and, and, and that's very uncomfortable for, for many South Africans. But that's how it is, you know. The fluctuation is what adds spice to life. Otherwise, life can become boring. Uh, until next week, fi manillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> أضحابه الحق بالخذلان مدفونا فبالجهاد بنى الإسلام قوته وهل لغير قوي الناس يصغونا رباه هيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا